I'm preaching a series called Want It All. And we're going to talk about January 2019 of being people that want everything that God has for them. Amen. And last week I preached on the will to want it all. And uh, how to have the desire to want everything God has. And this week I'm going to speak on the will to leave it all behind. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the, bury, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Every single one of us here this morning were called to bear fruit. Now, Jesus lived in the agricultural age where this illustration of the plowman made sense to the people. For a plowman to be successful in his work, he must concentrate on the job that he started. Because he knows that the only way forward is to not be distracted by what's behind. Because if the plowman looked back, his plow line would become crooked. And if that, if that happens, he's not going to yield a full harvest in the task that was set before him. He must focus on what's in front of him. The reason why we must have the will to leave former things behind is because if we will go back, we will not produce the kind of harvest that we were destined to produce in the kingdom of God. Many lives will not be changed if we decide to look back. Many generations will not hear a testimony like we heard today if we are not willing to leave the old behind and embrace the new that's in front of us. It takes courage to face what's in front of you, but more than that, even more, it also takes a strong will to leave the past behind. You've got to leave behind past success. You've got to leave behind past failure. You've got to leave behind past offenses. And the greatest enemy of a great harvest is looking back and wasting focus on the plow line of the future that God has in front of you. The most powerful way to leave the past behind is to fall in love with the future that God has for you. When Jesus made this comment, the people knew what he was referring to. God commanded Elijah to anoint Elisha as a prophet who would be a successor. Elijah found Elisha plowing with a 12 yoke of oxen before him in 1 Kings 19.19. 19. And without hesitation, Elisha immediately, the Bible says, let go of his physical plow to hold the spiritual plow that God called him to do. And Elisha's response was incredible. When he was called to follow the God, follow Elijah, he took a yoke of oxen, the Bible says, and he slaughtered them and boiled their flesh and using the oxen's equipment, gave it to the people and they ate. In other words, he, that was his livelihood, that was his job, that was everything he had left and he sacrificed and, and he presented it as a meal to other people as his only source of income that he had left he gave it up, as most people would say, you're absolutely crazy for giving up your livelihood, your, your bank account, everything you have is in those oxen. But immediately, the Bible said, he did this act. This is the kind of love that he had for the future. This was the kind of enthusiasm he had for what was next. He jumped into his future with every ounce of vigor that he had. There are old things, ladies and gentlemen, that hold us back. There are old patterns in life that hold us back. What is the old thing in your life that you need to let go of this morning? What is the one thing that you hold on to that you just don't want to let go? This was a major change in Elisha's life, and he fully embraces it. He left no attachments to yesterday. He was eager for what was next. He had the will to leave it all behind. You know, yesterday at the Rams game, I was there, and as I was cheering on the Rams and uh, letting the Cowboys know that that was, it was still our house, even though they had more fans than we did. The only comeback the Cowboys fans had yesterday was a Super Bowl they won a long, long time ago. Back in the days of leather helmets and all. No, it's better. And I told them, you just got to leave it all behind and embrace what's in front of you. But it wasn't as if Elijah's, Elisha's past wasn't important. He had an honorable job. He did have a great job. He did have an honorable career that he had. But not only was that honorable, it was more honorable for him to embrace the future. God said, where I'm taking you, I need full devotion. No partial surrender. I've got to have it all. 
That's why this world needs you, mom and dad. This world needs your heart and soul into everything that you do. A child needs their mom and dad um, uh, fully engaged into life. Somebody needs you to go into a recovery program and graduate the program because your story is not over. The best is yet to come. Somebody in the future needs what you've got to say. Somebody needs your overcoming story. The The future needs you. A child needs to see mom and dad graduate on this stage and have the the memory of success rather than the memory of all the hard nights that they came in late and and struggle with their addiction. Don't be too infatuated with all the things that you wish you were in the past. You have somebody who needs you in the future. And if you want to plow a straight line in the future, you can't look back and plow a straight future if you're looking back all the time. The world might have you in a bad place, and you can curse the world for dealing you an unfair hand, for putting you in that neighborhood, for putting you in that messed up family. You can live in that unfair story, and it might be unfair, but that's not a story that's going to help the world. It's, the victim card is not the, the, the card that's going to help other people and you. You can't change the past, but you can decide right now that you'll live and that you'll love and that you'll embrace what God has next. The unfair circumstances of yesterday or the possibilities of tomorrow. The devotion of the past or the commitment to the future. And Jesus told the farmer, don't look back. You won't plow an efficient harvest by doing that. I need the line straight going forward. I need a great 2019. Everything blessed is in the precision of looking forward to what God has for your life. Holding grudge is is looking back. It's what it is. It's plowing an uneven line in a crooked future. I mean, staying mad at the world and and what they've done to you is a crooked line for the future crops that we need, uh, that somebody needs for you to produce. It's plowing off course. Come alive to the future. When learning to drive a car, I remember years and years ago, and I'm just like terrified of the thought of of teaching my daughter to drive soon. I don't even know how to deal with this. Um, I'm just, it's it's terrifying to think that you can't control something. You're going to have to sit in the car. And uh, I try to contract it off to my redneck family in Arizona who lives up there in the woods, you know, and where there's no cars out there. My, and I think my brother-in-law might do it, you know. She might hit a cactus, but that's cool, you know. But uh, somewhere out there, I'm terrified at the prospect of it. And, and I remember when I was learning uh, back in the days of horses and carriages and, and all that, and uh, he said when you steer the horse, no, uh, when, you, when you drive the car, he, the guy told me something because I was driving. And I was doing this the whole time. I was just like holding the wheel, trying to stay in the lines. I was like going back and forth. I was so nervous. I was looking at the lines the whole time. And the guy that was teaching me driving, he said, no, you can't drive that way. He said, the only way you're going to drive in a straight line is you have to look far out into the future. And if you look far out into the road, you will manage to be able to drive in a straight line. But you can't look right to the left, front to the back. You've got to look far out in the future, and you will be able to drive in a straight line. And that's exactly the way it is with our life. You've got to love something greater in front of you more than you hold on to the hate that's what's behind you. The Bible says a perfect love casts out all fear. You can't fear what you choose to love. So if you fear something, decide to love it because you can't fear it anymore situation the other day that um, something, um, you know, a situation where somebody kind of did me wrong and somebody called me on the phone to sympathize with me. Man, man that, that person did you wrong. And they, were, and they were just trying to get my back. You know, they were just trying to tell me that they, they, they had my back on something. And, and I looked at them, I said, what? I, I don't even know what offense you're talking about. They said, yeah, I mean, they, I go, honestly, I go, I, I have already forgot that. I I can't even remember what that person did to me in 2018. I don't even remember anymore. I'm so focused on 2019, what's in front of me. I'm just too in love with the future. I have a love affair with the future. That's what I have. I'm cheating on my past. Sounds bad, doesn't it? Right? I'm cheating on my past, and I'm having an affair with my future. Right? And it's, okay, it's a horrible illustration, but it's 9.15. I'll clean it up in the 11. God wants us to have the will to not only want it all, but the will to leave some things behind. That drives me crazy. uh, That's why I love my dad. My my dad, he's always, you know, my dad loves the old-time music. He does. He loves the old-time worship. But when he comes to church, he's just fully in love with embracing the future. 
he, he just comes to church, and he's 81 years of age, and, and he has a, the music that he prefers, but he always says this. He said, he goes, I had my time and, and my preferences for so many decades of music. He said, now I'm going to sit back and watch the young people enjoy. I'm going to sit back, and I'm just going to embrace what God has for me next. I mean, whatever is next, you got to embrace. I mean, like Ariana Grande said, thank you, next. I mean, just whatever is I know it's bad, right? I'm so tired of that song. It's the worst song ever. Don't ever play it ever around me, ever. Oh, how is that the song of the year? I have no idea. Okay, but, but better than that, all things work together for good to the love of the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Don't plow a crooked line going forward because what's happening is you're looking back. And that's why I love the Dream Center Leadership School class that's just come in. They've decided that they want to have a great future. They've got to embrace whatever radical thing that's in front of them that's leaving Switzerland, leaving New Zealand, leaving Australia, and saying, God, in order to experience something I've never experienced somewhere, I've got to change the scenery of my life. I've got to see something different to go to a different perspective. Embracing. Embracing what's in front of you. Uh, someone got me this for Christmas, and um, it's awesome because a very wealthy man got me this for Christmas. I opened the present. To be honest with you, I thought it was going to be a Rolex. And I opened up, and it was this. And I thought, okay, and then I just start kind of wearing it all day. I have neck problems all the time when I sleep. And I just start wearing this, you know, everywhere. And I thought to myself, man, this is kind of cool because I, I can't go this way, that, that, man, that way. just kind of keeps me in line, man. Just like going on a plane. I used to always get neck injuries. And, you know, I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I thought to myself, man, we need people in our life that are like neck braces to us, man. We're trying to look to the right. No. No. I'm trying to look, but no. That just people like this that just brace us, man, that just keep us locked into our future, keep us embracing possibilities that God has for us, you know, just looking forward all the time, looking forward, just keep moving forward all the time. We need some people that have that neck brace spirit upon our life to, that was a good throw, to keep us moving forward. Be a neck brace for someone's future. Hold them accountable to the future. We're always talking about like going into people's past and holding them accountable to their past. And uh, your past is this. And, and you know, we must dig, dig in deep into your past. And I'm sure there are things that we need to do in looking into people's past. But we're so consumed nowadays with looking into people's past and holding them accountable to their past. But why don't we spend some time holding people accountable to their future? And right now, somebody is watching on live stream because we just went on live stream. And I want to encourage you to look forward, plow a straight line, prepare yourself for a harvest by creating the future that you are born to embrace. A new harvest is, is being crafted today. The future needs you to plow a meticulous, well-attended future. Because you can't build on regret. You can't build on could have, should have, would have. You build on what you have right now. And what you have right now is that you're breathing. And if you are breathing, it means that you have an opportunity. Even if you're barely breathing, you have an opportunity. God kept you alive for a reason. Plow your way forward. Your cholesterol pill did not keep you alive. Your blood pressure medicine did not keep you alive. What keeps us alive is the reason to get up in the morning and God decided to get you out of bed. So therefore, you have a reason to live and you have a future. So plow a straight line and don't look back. Leave the old stuff behind you. There's a, there's a future that's in front of you. And that's why I love about this ministry because when people come into to our discipleship program, we're just we're dreaming from day one. How dare you tell someone to dream when they've had a 10-year meth addiction? How dare you tell somebody to dream? How dare you have a place called a dream center when we're just trying to get people to survive? It's life and death. Dreaming is life and death. Because if there is no vision, there is no self-control. The Bible says where there is no revelation, that people cast off restraint. Which means when you cast off restraint, it means that you are living in a death certificate. You are a dead person walking. It's only a matter of time before something puts an end to your life. But the Bible says that where there is a vision, there is life. And when you're dealing with people in recovery, you just can't speak to the symptoms of what put them in that place. You've got to speak to the future of what they can become because nobody will rise up on where they are unless they have a vision for the future. Leave the old stuff behind. There's a field in front of you to plow, and we need a straight line, and you're not going to get it looking back. I close with this. Thank you. Someone said fire. I love that. Someone was fire. Thank you. Mm, my, 
Christian. You know, I, I love you know I love ESPN stories. I I am addicted to the ESPN stories. Everyone. One night I watched like 15 in a row. In a row, those little 21 minute things in a row. I just, I love, I record all of them. And, um, you know, I, I've watched the stories, the ESPN special about the high school girl who has MS and she runs um, the two mile. And every time she runs, her body collapses. It could be like the last run of her career. And so she runs with MS and she's one of like a state champion runner in North Carolina. And she gets to the finish line, like a 3,200, and she collapses every race. She like fully collapses almost on the doorstep of death every time she runs. And I watch this story, and I'm just, I'm so touched by all these amazing stories. And, and then the other stories that I, that I follow about the dude been, like, uh, bit by a shark twice, and he, get, and he goes out for the third time and competes in surfing competition in Australia. I love Australians. They're always tough, man. When I, ran, when I ran the World Marathon Challenge, it was an Australian doctor who told me, he said, you better get out there and run. I don't care how sick you are. you got to finish your seventh marathon. I love those guys. But, um... But that's straight. He, like, he gets bit by, he's like, I got bit by, I can't, how do you talk like an Aussie? Here, how do you talk like an Aussie? Do you know how to talk? You, you, yeah, but you give it a try, give it a try. Say, I got bit by a shark, but I came out, I got bit by a shark. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. But he gets back up again, he goes again. I mean, it's like, who does that? Like, I would never do that, but God bless him for it. And, um, but there's one that really inspired me. It's a story of a girl named Pratima Sherpa from Nepal. Maybe you've seen her story. This is an amazing story. Her dad is a groundskeeper in one of the only um, golf courses in Nepal. Her entire family lives in a shed on the golf course where they keep the equipment. So basically, she la lives in this shed. There's only a small portion, maybe 90% of it is for equipment, rakes, um, sand trap, uh, the stuff that whatever they do with sand trap. I live there in the sand trap. I should know. But um, just all these different grooming, you know, golf stuff in, in the other side. And so she, her dad makes like $20 a month. They live in the shed, I think, on the fourth hole of the golf course. And, and girls, in, obviously, in, in Nepal, culturally don't play golf. And so especially not the poorest of the poor. And so she wanted to play so desperately. And, and uh, she watched all the golfers, the uh, the only the wealthy in Nepal would come by and play, and she would watch them play, and she would be so, so stirred by watching them. And, um, but her dad said, well, girls in Nepal don't play. But then her dad kind of got bothered by, by turning her down, and so he wanted to at least give her a try. And he went out to the woods, and he cut down um, a, little, a little tree, and he, a, a little portion of a tree, and made a little golf club made out of wood. I mean, we're not talking about the professional ones, almost like a hockey stick, like Happy Gilmore style, you know? And... Uh, one of those, and, and so she went out and started playing on the golf course with this wooden stick and just hitting. And some of the pros saw her, and they were so touched by this girl who lived in the shed as a groundskeeper shed trying to do her best to play golf. And so some of the wealthy people that come in and, uh, and play, they all rallied together and got her a bag of mixed clubs. And she started playing with a bag of mixed clubs, and she started winning tournaments in Nepal. She started winning other tournaments in, 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 in different places all around the country. And she became successful, but there was no women's tour to get on, so she had to actually go out and to train on the men's tour and try to make the men's uh, team the top four out of Nepal to get their pro tour card to play for the nation. But only four would get it, and there was 21 entries. And... They built it up, and, and they, she was trying to get her family out of poverty, trying to get them out of the shed. That was her dream, to get them out of that place. And so she had to play with all the men, and she got out there, and, uh, and she ended up, I think, getting like ninth out of 21 in the tournament and fell short. And, but I love, I love the end of the story because when it was over, they said, and after her, her dream was crushed of trying to get her family out of the shed, they showed her out there at the driving range an hour after the biggest loss of her life. And she was out there just hitting the balls, just hitting those balls an hour after losing. And uh, tears streaming down her eyes. She's hitting the ball. She's going for it anyways. And she's out there and, 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 and working on her future despite the big loss in her life. And of all the elements of that story, of all the courageous acts of that woman, who probably one day will get her card. And, uh, and people like Tiger Woods heard the story and they met her and actually played a round of golf with her. And uh, people are starting to visit the shed where she lives in to try to help her. And, and people arranging tours for her to come to America and play and all these miracles that are happening but every time there's a setback she goes right back to the course an hour later and she just hitting more of those golf balls because she realizes that there's nothing for you when you look back regret is not an option she didn't have time to regret the past she was already plowing a road forward towards 
a better future. I want to tell you this morning, stay alive, put the past behind, and in everything, just keep plowing that straight line towards your future. Every barrier that you face, every unfair advantage growing up, all of that is, is going to be an element to your story one day. It's going to be a part of someone's changed life. The world needs the elements you were raised in that you will overcome. Somebody needs your story. But if you're going to be fit for the kingdom of God, Jesus said, you can't look back. You have got to plow a straight line forward. Every head bowed, every eye closed all over this room. The will to leave it all behind. If you're here this, this morning and say, Pastor, I'm bound by sin, I'm bound by things I've done in my life and I'm ashamed of, and I just feel overwhelmed by the weight of my sin, that's why Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross, to overwhelm what was overwhelming you, to overwhelm sorrow, to overwhelm sadness, to, to give you a hope and a reason to live and a reason to dream again and to believe. And in every service here at this church, we give people an opportunity to acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about religion. Religion bores me. Wars have been fought over religion. I'm talking about a relationship with a Savior that loves you so much. He left everything in heaven to come down to earth. He died on that cross, lived, lived 33 years of sinless life so that he could be the kind of sacrifice you and I need. And that was a perfect one. The perfect one came for those who were imperfect to give his life. If you're here today and say, Pastor, I'm not living for God. I'm not, I don't have a relationship with Christ. But I, I, I want to know what it's like to truly have a future so great that I can plow a straight line forward. I don't want to look back and be dominated by things that I wish I had or wish I would have done. You know, it breaks my heart more than when people say, I wish I would have done this or that. Because in God's kingdom, God can redeem everything that you've wasted in just in any season he wants to. In one day, he can restore everything that has been taken. Or he can take you on an adventure of years. But God can do anything he wants to do. He's not wanting people to regret the past. He's wanting you to embrace the now. We have a God that redeems all things. I've seen it happen. I've seen people in prisons that Clarence has visited. They, they've gone to the prison system and walked in there. There's, there's guys, he's had to go to solitary confinement with muzzles around them because they were so dangerous. Give their life to Christ and radically decide they want to follow Jesus. I've seen people sentenced to 30 years come to the Dream Center. Now I go across the road and preach. They come up to me and say, I'm now a pastor. I've seen it all. God can restore. Don't live in regret. Don't live in shame any longer. Live under the power and the grace of the cross. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. One, the Holy Spirit is moving. Two, if you're here today, you want to exchange your sin for the grace of God and a mission and a reason to live. All over this room, leave it all behind. Leave the shame. Leave the words. Leave the abuse. Leave everything anyone's ever tried to do to, to you to stop you from embracing Christ. Leave that all behind. Look forward to where your future is, and that is a relationship with Christ and eternity and salvation in heaven with him forever. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we, are confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is none righteous, no, not one. No, none of us are qualified on our own. We are, we are qualified because of what Jesus has done for us. If that's you all over this room, I want you to raise your hands across this room right now. Three, lift them up. Yes, yes, that, yes, thank you, 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 thank you. They're going up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everywhere, hands are going up. They're going up everywhere. Praise God, hands are going up. So many, so many. Others of you will say, Pastor, I have a relationship with Christ, but I, I need to leave some things behind that stop me from plowing the future God has for me. Raise your hand. You might be the best Christian in this room, but you're looking back too much. You need a spiritual neck brace to keep you looking forward today. Hands are going up all over this room. It's time to go forward. It's time to, as David did, stop the morning and start living. Hands are going up. It's time. It's time to go. Hands are going up. Praise God. Everyone that raised your hand to accept Christ and you that didn't, you need this prayer. Repeat these words after me loud and strong. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross that I might be saved. I repent of my sin. 
and I give you my life. Thank you for dying for me. Now I look forward to living for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.